Hi, I'm Mincy Moffitt. I'm a botanist with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources and the Georgia Natural Heritage Program. Today, we're here at the Lower Broad River Wildlife Management Area, and we are at a site that supports a very rare plant, the dwarf sumac or Michaud's sumac. Uh, this plant is federally listed under the Endangered Species Act is endangered. It's protected under Georgia state law, the Wildflower Preservation Act, and it's also protected in several other states in which it occurs. This species is known historically only from five states, Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia. And it's extirpated from Florida and South Carolina. So right now it's only found in Georgia, North Carolina, and Virginia. NatureServe has listed this plant, ranks this plant as being imperiled throughout its range. And in Georgia, it's actually critically imperiled. Most people in Georgia probably have never seen dwarf sumac because it is so rare, but they are probably familiar with other species of sumac, even if they're, uh, even if they're not aware of it. Sumac typically grows along roadsides and fences on highways and along pastures. And you probably have noticed uh, it's a small, uh, small trees or large shrubs that have this sort of conical red fruits that will be very evident in late summer and throughout the fall. And the foliage will turn a beautiful, bright, deep red and purple. So if you see a big bright red purple hedge along the side of the road with these conical red fruits, and you know you're looking at some species of sumac. Historically, woodlands and savannas in the southeastern U.S. were kept open by a combination of the grazing and browsing of large animals and also fire. Fire that, was, that resulted from lightning strikes and also from intentional setting by Native Americans. During the last hundred years, there's been a very aggressive program of fire suppression in this country. And as a result, habitats that used to be opened have now been choked and clogged with woody vegetation and plants that depend on these open sunlit habitats are in decline. The Georgia Department of Natural Resources and the Georgia Plant Conservation Alliance, the GPCA, started aggressively managing this site about 15 years ago in 2005. At that time, the number of stems, the above ground visible stems on this site had dwindled to two. What you see before you, what is now this half acre uh, open system, open pocket system was actually a completely closed canopy 15 years ago. The dwarf sumac is rare because it has a suite of unique habitat requirements. One is that it needs an open sunlit savanna or woodland sort of community, rocky, sandy soils. Uh, a lot of people, some, many people are confused uh, between what a woodland is and what a forest is. A forest is essentially uh, a, an area with a closed canopy where the, where the top branches of the trees have closed in and allow very little sunlight to hit the forest floor. A woodland is where about half to a third of the canopy is open so that you get much more sunlight that hits the forest floor and it promotes much more uh, herbaceous and graminoid ground cover. Uh, what you see here around us is a very dense ground cover that's being promoted by the fact that we are in a woodland setting. The other important requirement for dwarf sumac habitat is that in Georgia at least it's associated with mafic geology. And mafic refers to uh, rocks or geology that, were, that are very high in iron, very high in magnesium, frequently high in calcium. They were produced at great depths below the earth at very great temperatures and pressures. And when they, through geologic processes, uh, are driven up to the, to the uh, surface of the soil and they weather over time, their minerals the magnesium, the calcium is released into the soil and that actually raises the pH of the soil, makes the soil less acidic. So the, the dwarf sumac needs a pH that's in the circumneutral area, about a 7, 6.5 to 7.5. So that mafic geology is what creates the soil that allows the roots to flourish. So we got after this closed canopy. First thing we did is we came in and we felled or girdled about 50 trees on site. Then we instituted annual work parties where we would come in with loppers and remove 
woody shrubs, coppice sprouts, root sprouts, and any sort of seedlings that might have moved into the area. We also used, judiciously, we also used herbicide uh, on woody material outside of the sumac zone, outside of the rare species zone. And we used the cut stump method or the cut and paint method to make sure that we reduced drift and didn't have any uh, spill accidents. And the last thing we did was the biggie. We reintroduced fire into the landscape. This site has burned has been burned with prescribed fire five times in the last 15 years. And I want to thank Shan Kamak and Nick Holbrooks of WRD for leading that effort. We are up now to 1,500 stems, up from two, from two at its lowest now to 1,500. And after the most recent burn this past March, we doubled the highest total of stems prior to that. We had about 830 or so stems four or five years ago after the last burn. This March, after this March's burn, we're now up to 1,500 stems. I mentioned earlier that in 2005, the number of stems showing above ground in this population were down to two. After a couple of burns, uh, the population increased to about 150 stems. A genetic study by uh, the Atlanta Botanical Garden led by Dr. Jenny Cruz Sanders determined that they were actually 10 different genetic individuals present on site. And if you do the math, what that means is, is that if there were only two stems showing and later sampling indicated that there were 10 different genetic individuals, that means that at a minimum, there were eight different genetic individuals that were hanging out in dormancy below the ground. And after we burned, they were released from dormancy and they began to spread and reproduce. This species is dioecious, which means that individual plants are either male or female. Male plants have male flowers only. Female plants have female flowers only. This is actually a pretty rare condition among flowering plants. Most plant families, about 90% of them, have either male and female flowers on the same individual, or they have hermaphroditic flowers, which means that there are male and female parts in the same flower. This population was an all-male clonal population that reproduced and spread asexually through root sprouts and rhizomes. On Valentine's Day 2010, we transplanted some female plants from Georgia's other natural population near Covington into this site. The Covington population is an all-female population and it's been persisting asexually just like the male population here. By bringing the two together, we're trying to encourage some sexual reproduction. Over the next five years, we plan to burn this site at least once, maybe twice. Uh, we're going to keep expanding the woodland habitat up here. We may use a piece of equipment called a, uh, a skid steer mulcher to actually get in and grind down some of the hardwoods. Uh, this, this area, the total area that's bounded by two roads in the river is 40 acres. We're only making use of about a half an acre of that now. So we're gonna, ultimately, my goal is to open up the spine of this, uh, of this knoll, of this ridge, uh, at least 10 acres uh, so that we can recreate this kind of habitat. Hopefully over time, we can expand this uh, roost population out and out and out. I mean, eventually, I hope to uh, have it there to be 5,000 stems or more. That may be a 10-year project, but we're, uh, we're ambitiously uh, we're ambitiously trying to improve this site. This is the best site in Georgia, and it's also one of the best sites uh, throughout the range of Bruce Mishoei in, in Georgia, North Carolina, and Virginia. So let, let's talk a little bit about the, the plant itself. This is dwarf sumac, and you'll notice that it is a short-statured plant. It has leaves that are about a foot or a foot and a half long, and each one of these things is actually a leaflet, and each leaf has somewhere between 9, 11, 13 leaflets. It's an odd number of leaflets because it has this terminal leaflet. It's also really, really fuzzy. If you had an up close and personal with this, you would see that it's got a very thick pubescence on it, very soft pubescence that it holds pretty much throughout the year. This is a deciduous plant, meaning that it's gonna drop its leaves. Uh, in fact, it's in, so this whole thing is gonna fall off um, in, the, in, in the fall and in the winter. And the next year, it may sprout from the end of this and make a new shoot uh, that grows six or eight inches. 
it'll do the same thing. It'll have leaves on it. The next year it may do this six or eight inches. The next year it may do this six or eight inches. And then for a reason that nobody still really understands, nobody knows, it's gonna die back to the ground. But that's okay because as we've talked about earlier, there's an extensive rhizomal and root mat underneath this half acre. It's just a complete net of uh, of Roos Michoui dwarf sumac roots. And so it may, it may die here, but it's gonna pop up in a whole bunch of other places. And as the habitat becomes more favorable, it's gonna pop up increasingly so. So that's how we've gone from two stems above ground in 2005 to 1500 stems above ground in 2020. We mentioned that initially this was an all male site, an all male clonal site. And in 2010, we introduced a patch of females to this site in the hopes of getting some sexual reproduction. And you can see here that we actually do have uh, this terminal, terminal panicle of fruits, um, this infructescence, uh, uh, lots, of, lots of little red fruits, little red berries. Uh, so the initial, the initial feeling is great. We finally got some sexual reproduction here. Inside each one of these fruits will be some seeds. Unfortunately, what we don't know is who the father is. We don't know if it is if it was pollinated by a Rus Michoui of the same species or if it was pollinated by one of the other sumacs, by one of the other Rus. We have wing sumac on site, we have smooth sumac on site, and both of those produce pollen in profusion, so there is a chance that this is actually a hybrid. We are currently doing or planning to do some genetic studies to determine the parentage uh, and, uh, and heredity of these, uh, these babies.